Uh, well, welcome everybody uh, visiting in the back. Great to have you here in the briefing room. Uh, I don't have anything at the top, so Matt and uh, your lovely scarf, let's go to what's on your mind. Thank you. And the people of New Zealand appreciate it as well. He is giving a shout out to the people of New, Ze New Zealand. It should or be at noted. least their rugby team. Their rugby team. Um, okay. Can we just start very briefly on Syria? You will have seen and probably know about the uh, removal of at least some of the chemical weapons mm -hmm. today or some of the chemical weapons components. Do you have anything at all to say about that? Is this a you know, positive first step, even mm -hmm. though it's a couple days or maybe even a, a week beyond uh, when it was supposed to happen? Uh, we do. One moment. <clears throat> uh, well, we, of course, uh, welcome the announcement by the OPCW uh, that an initial amount uh, of priority chemical uh, materials were removed from Syria today. Uh, this re represents continued progress toward the elimination of Syria's chemical weapons program. Much more m uh, needs to be done. As the international community has made clear, it is the Assad regime's responsibility to transport the chemicals to Latakia safely to facilitate their removal. We expect them to meet their obligations to do so. Uh, and of course, uh, for further details, we'd refer to the OPCW right. mission. Well, are you satisfied with what happened today in terms of the regime's securing the route? We have the, no port. reason to believe that the regime has uh, gone back on any aspect of their promise. All right. And then That's also related to Syria, but not specifically this, is, is has the thinking about uh, possible Iranian involvement in Geneva II evolved at all since where it was uh, over the weekend or yesterday? Uh, nothing has changed since uh, the Secretary spoke to it, since senior administration officials spoke to it, since uh, my colleague Marie spoke to it uh, yesterday. Uh, let's follow up uh, real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. The Syrian government is saying that the public would like to see President Bashar Assad run again in 2014. Do you have any comment on that? The Syrian regime is saying that? Uh, well, sp government spokesmen, they're saying that the <clears throat> Syrian public would like to see Bashar Assad run again for the presidency. Well, I haven't seen those comments before I came down here, Saeed, but yeah. our position hasn't changed that a brutal dictator who has uh, killed tens of thousands of his people is not someone that uh, we see a future for in, in the country of Syria. Uh, they also say uh, that priority number one is to fight terrorism, which obviously they are the opponents of the regime. So you have any c comment on that? We, you would like to fight terrorism, correct? Uh, well, certainly. Anyway. I think you're familiar with our right. commitment and, and views about fighting terrorism. I'm not sure I understand what your question is. The, the question is, he's saying that the priority should be to fight terrorism. He's actually drawing similarities between what is happening in Iraq, what is happening in Russia, and in many ways, these people that do what they, their deeds in Russia and Iraq and in Syria basically espouse the same ideology. Well, I would caution anyone to be spun by the uh, comments of the Syrian regime uh, comparing their brutality to uh, or trying to distract from their brutality. You know what our focus is, which is bringing an end to the civil war, bringing an end to the suffering and bloodshed of the Syrian people. That remains the case and hasn't changed. And finally, uh, he, they're saying, the government's saying that any agreement concluded in Geneva should be subject to a public uh, referendum. Would you agree with that uh, kind of approach? Uh, again, I haven't seen those comments, but I think you're pretty familiar with what our view is of a, the goal of a Geneva conference, which is, of course, uh, putting, in place to make, uh, putting in place a process to make progress on implementation of a Geneva communique. But there are many components of that, including putting a transitional government in place. Uh, that's what our focus is. Again, we're not dealing with uh, an actor here who has uh, treated and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, represented the interests of his people, so, uh, so I will leave it at that. And you wouldn't be opposed to having a, a referendum that is done in accordance with international I think standards. what our focus is, Saeed, right now is on bringing both sides to the table. It's important to note that uh, a Geneva conference on January 22nd would be the first time in this three-year conflict that both sides would be at the table to work to end, end the conflict. Go ahead, Nadia. Just to follow up on mm -hmm. that, uh, the Syrian government is saying now it's conditional that their participation in Geneva too is based on making the focus of the conference is fighting terrorism. So they're not talking about Geneva 1. So my question to you is, how would you reconcile this position of having the conference on time if the Syrian government, which is the main participant, 
are already saying to you that it's not going to be Geneva 1, but actually the focus will be fighting terrorism. Well, there have been a range of comments from both sides over the past several months, as we all know. Uh, the focus of the conference has not changed. The goal of the conference has not changed. Uh, it is to implement uh, the Geneva communique. It is to put a process in place to uh, make progress in that. That has not changed. Uh, as we have said from the beginning, the Russians have played a pivotal role in bringing the regime to the table. They've said they would go. They have brought them to the table with those same conditions I just laid out in mind. Uh, as you, as you've seen reported, but I can of course confirm now that the secretary will be meeting with Foreign Minister Lavrov on the 13th this weekend. Uh, part of that, a big part of their meeting, will be focused on preparations and implementation, uh, or preparations for the Geneva Conference, uh, bringing both sides to the table and, and, and how they want to proceed from there. So you're still hoping that the Russians will deliver the Syrian government regardless of the rhetoric that they're saying in public? Yes. Now. Okay. And one last uh, follow-up. Just on the live sure. meeting. Where? Uh, it's in Paris. It'll be on Paris. Uh, uh, okay. Paris. And I'm sorry, but the 13th, I believe, is Monday, not over the weekend. Oh, sorry. Right? It? Sorry to be to be just, to be. Uh, no, I just particular. want to make sure I'm looking at the right. Uh, it's, maybe it's actually over the weekend here. I was thinking time zones. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, it is. It is on the 13th, Sorry. which is Monday. Okay. And, and we'll have more details. One more thing. We'll have more details on upcoming travel. Uh, I would expect in the next 24 hours. And just to follow up as well, uh, the opposition <coughs> are saying now they wanted a written uh, agreement that you guys will make sure that Assad is not going to be part of any solution. I know they keep changing their mind often and probably will show up, but do you think that this also will complicate things that they really have demands before attending Geneva too? Well, we've been very clear that the uh, only precondition to Geneva participation is support for implementation of a Geneva communique. Uh, we've also been clear about what our goal is here. We don't want to see a future with Assad as a part of it, uh, given his brutality, given what he's done to his people. We have stated that countless times. The opposition should have no doubt about where the United States stands, but the goal of the conference, which has many players, uh, including countries around the world, including the UN, uh, has not changed either. Uh, Jen, do you, mm -hmm. do you feel that the difference, uh, differences between the opposition groups uh, in Istanbul will affect the uh, conference? The differences between the groups? Um, well, it shouldn't be surprising that uh, there are disagreements uh, about the opposition strategy, uh, given the horrible events on the ground. Uh, those meetings are ongoing uh, in Istanbul. Uh, we understand um, they're not finished yet, so uh, we're not going to prejudge the outcome of them and, and where things stand uh, at the outcome before And do you expect them to take a decision favoring the participation in Geneva? That is certainly what we're hopeful of and what we've been uh, working toward. Well, let's put it this way. You mm -hmm. said that the Russians have basically followed through or come through on their pledge to deliver mm -hmm. the Syrian government. Do you believe that you will be able to come through on your pledge to deliver a credible and representative delegation from the opposition? We do, and okay. that's what we're working with them on the ground uh, to do. Despite the fact that they keep <clears throat> issuing statements that they will not attend, provided certain conditions are met, like a preordained uh, commitment that Assad will step aside? Well, say there have been, as I mentioned, a range of statements. Uh, we're not going to uh, read into those until the meetings are concluded and they've made an announcement about their decision. Uh, uh, let me ask you something. How do you envision this conference? You have a big plenary session where mm -hmm. everybody meets and they give speeches and so on. Then you have the opposition and the regime with the Lakhdar Ibrahimi or the UN team. Mm -hmm. Is that how you see it? Well, I, I don't want to get ahead of the UN announcement about the exact agenda, which is a good question that you're asking. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, uh, yesterday, and, and Marie mentioned, uh, the UN officially uh, issued their invitation. So there are uh, more than two dozen countries uh, that are invited, and we're working through, and the UN is working through exactly how the agenda and the, and the process will take place. But uh, the focus of these uh, discussions and negotiations will be uh, having the two parties at the table and, and, and discussing these, these tough issues. Syria? Mm -hmm. Syria. Um, uh, ban Ki-moon said today that they have not sent an official invitation to Iran. Correct. Is this something that you think it will, in the next few days, that they will still extend that invitation? Or are you happy that there is no invitation was sent to them? Our, our position on this hasn't changed. Uh, and, and he uh, indicated in December, the UN did, which countries they would be inviting. Yesterday was the official formal issuing of those invitations. So that was the process that took place. Uh, our view has been that uh, and the Secretary reiterated this 
not once, not twice, but three times over the weekend that unless Iran uh, endorses, uh, supports, embraces the Geneva communique, uh, we wouldn't support their attendance. Uh, of course, it's a decision for the UN to make, uh, and I would point you to them for any more specifics on it. If you want, if that you're lowering the bar now a little bit. I mean, we discussed quite at length yesterday, and we saw the um, briefing by the senior State Department official um, that, you know, if they, they may not have to actually endorse Geneva 1, um, but if they could make some gesture <coughs> to show that they're willing to be helpful, that maybe there is some way, shape, or form that even if they're not a full participant at the foreign ministry level, that they could participate in some, in some symbolic way without having to sign on to the whole communicate. So. Well, uh, first let me be absolutely clear here. I'm very familiar with these senior officials who were speaking. Um, and one, uh, nothing has changed about full participation uh, by Iran in a Geneva conference. That has been, has always been, continues to be uh, you know, unless they were to uh, endorse, uh, embrace, support the Geneva communique, that's not something we feel should be considered. Uh, beyond that, the point that was being made, it was not an issuing of an invitation or an offer. It was making what should be a fairly obvious point, which is that at this point, Iran has done nothing but help the regime, uh, help uh, bring foreign fighters in, uh, help uh, 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 the regime's efforts to uh, brutalize the Syrian people. And if they wanted to send a message to uh, the world about their seriousness of having a positive outcome, there are steps they could take. There's no indication that they have any desire or interest in taking well, any of, of these steps. Their fight, sh short of taking their fighters out of Syria that are battling the rebels, um, what they're, a par they're a party to the fighting, so I don't see how they could really be helpful if they're a party to the fighting. I think you may have hit the nose on the... Hit the, I'm going to mess up the analogy. Whatever. <laughs> Hit the nail on the head. Hit the nose. Either, I skipped a word there. But it does sound like at the same time you acknowledge that Iran does have influence in this situation and that their participation in some way um, would be important. And so it does seem as if we, the we, goal... We the, did not say that their participation would be important. We've never said that. Uh, that's not what the United States believes. I'm not saying that you're... It does seem, though, that there is an effort <laughs> being made to kind of lower the goalpost from accepting the full communique in order to have the price of admission um, to, so that they'll be there in some way, whether it's at a observer level or whether it's at an ambassador level. I mean, there is an effort underway. Can't you acknowledge to get Iran to the conference? Uh, I, I would not uh, acknowledge that from the view of the United States. Uh, I think what the effort was was to state uh, what should be, again, pretty obvious, which is there are steps that Iran could take to indicate to the international community that they want to see a positive outcome. There's no indication that they're going to do that or plan to do that. The United States' position hasn't changed on this. Uh, it's less likely than likely that any of this would be worked through. Obviously, this will be discussed this weekend with the London 11, with Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, and we'll proceed from there. So just just a, point, point mm -hmm. that first, you said hit the nose on the head, and then at least said lower the goalpost. Let's try to get our... Lower the bar, move the <laughs> goalpost. Oh. Elise and I, we need, need it. We need a cheat sheet on, on analogies. Yes, I was reaching for that. <laughs> Jim, you're saying that, to understand you clearly, that Iran's participation is not important. Is that what you're saying? What I said, what I'm saying clearly here, Saeed, is that our position has been, continues to be, that unless Iran... Uh, were to uh, support, the under, co to communicate, let me finish, mm. were communique, uh, in order to be, that we would not, do not think they should be considered for mm. participation. Mm. Iran has been supporting the regime. Everybody knows that. They have not mm. indicated mm. that they want to play a positive role in an outcome. That is different than other players <laughs> who have been invited and are participating in the Geneva Conference, okay. are planning to participate. If Iran is excluded, it should be excluded on the basis that it is a party to the conflict? I'm sorry? Is that, is that what you're saying? It should be excluded on the basis that it is party to the conflict or is the regime. That's the only reason? Iran or is has it not. Because, because perhaps there are some other regional powers that have a veto on Iran. Uh, Iran has not. You are right that there are many in the international community that have strong feelings about whether or not Iran should participate. That certainly is a factor. I'm certain the UN is factoring in. However, Iran has still not uh, in, taken the step that we've been saying for months they should take. They've not indicated they plan to take the step, so our position remains the same. 
Do we have any more on Syria? Uh, some more of the uh, conser some of the more conservative members of the Iranian political uh, climate have suggested that having a lower level or a symbolic representation at Geneva II is frankly insulting to Iran given how much influence they say they have on the regime. Was it that senior official's intent to be in any way insulting or cast aspersions on Iranians' usefulness at these talks? Uh, I think uh, Iran is not currently participating in the talks, so they don't have a role at the talks. Uh, there wasn't an offer or an invitation made. Uh, that ha there hasn't been one made by the United States, which wouldn't even be our place to make, or the United Nations. Uh, so I will leave it at that. Do we have any more on Syria? Oh, would, go ahead, Elise. Would, would you like to see Iran participate if it agrees to the, the, the terms of Geneva 1? If they agree to the terms of Geneva 1, then we, would, uh, think, uh, then, then we would consider it. But obviously that hasn't happened. We d there's no indication it will happen. We're talking about a conference in two weeks. But even though they are participating as <coughs> fighters alongside the Assad regime, if they accept Geneva 1, they can come right in. We will consider it at that point if that were to happen uh, with all the factors. But again, there's no indication uh, that that's the direction uh, things are going in. Go uh, Syria, Iraq question. Mm -hmm. The Iraqi justice minister told. Uh, well, let me. Did you have one on Syria, Elise, or did you? No, I have another. It's, okay. it's Syria. Oh, Syria. Okay, yeah. sorry. I thought you were going to the Iraq. The Iraqi Go ahead. justice minister said yesterday in an interview with the Iraqi TV that. Uh, Iraqi security forces allowed al-Qaeda terrorists to flee from Iraqi prisons to go to Syria uh, as part of a plot to help Assad regime uh, to scare the U.S. against the removal of Assad. Uh, well, I, I haven't actually read those comments. I, I think we've said many times in here that there's no question that uh, the uh, longstanding tensions uh, in Iraq have been exploited, sectarian tensions have been exploited by the situation in Syria. And we have expressed uh, a concern about uh, the influx of fighters, about what's been happening on the borders. Uh, so that's not something that is new. Uh, but I don't have, and I haven't seen those specific comments uh, that you're mentioning. The Can least? You take the question? Sure, I'm happy to look into it. Yeah, I want to ask about Dennis Rodman. Okay. Um, he gave an interview to CNN. Mm -hmm. I'm sure maybe you saw it. Mm -hmm. I won't go into the whole outburst of it, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, but he did speak about Kenneth Bay in a way that was kind of concerning to some people in terms of making an, an indictment on his guilt, saying, well, you don't know what he did, and seeming that he had some facts in the case. And I'm wondering, I know that you've dismissed his trip as a private trip, and and have kind of separated him from Kenneth Bay because there's not you didn't feel that there was anything he mm -hmm. could do to seek his release. But now the fact that he's speaking on Kenneth Bay's guilt in the country where you're trying to get this man released, I'm wondering, does that raise concerns about you that while this trip may not have been helpful in any sense, now it's being harmful? Well, we don't have any specific comments on his comments. I did see the interview that he did. Uh, as you know, but it's worth reiterating, we remain uh, very committed to securing Kenneth Bay's release, and we remain gravely concerned about his health. Uh, and that is the focus of the United States government. Uh, as we've said before, um, Mr. Rodman is not there representing the United States. Uh, people should remember that when they look at his comments and hear his comments. Uh, our view uh, has not changed on this, and we're working through our own diplomatic channels uh, and making every effort uh, to secure his release. So you're working through your own channels to get him released, but when someone who, for whatever reason, the leader of this country feels, you know, respects him and respects his opinion, is making an indictment on the man's guilt, um, never mind what uh, any of us think. I mean, do you think that that puts Mr. Bay in any jeopardy? Well, we already have, are concerned about the situation he's in, further to be jeopardy. fair. Um, I am just reiterating, I don't have any further comments or analysis of the impact, um, but other than to say that uh, his comments are not representative of the views of the United States government because obviously he's not speaking on our behalf and he's not there on our behalf. So we're working through our own channels. I'm not going to do more analysis of his comments and, and what they may or may not mean. 
Do we have any more on that topic? I saw that. Mm-hmm. From Rodman and, mm-hmm. and his intent to sort of entertain the supreme leader, whatever they call him. Uh, do you have a position on that? Do you discourage the, the players from playing for Kim Jong-un? Uh, I, I don't think, I know we've talked about this quite a bit. I'm not sure I have more analysis for you today. I did see the uh, statement that was issued by the NBA, which is appropriate for them to issue yeah. it on that particular topic. Uh, but beyond that, I'm not sure I have well, much more. One of the things that mm-hmm. Commissioner Stern said in the statement was that there is a time and place for sports diplomacy, sure. and this is not one of them, those times. Uh, do you agree with that? Well, given he is not there as part of a government program or a United States government program, obviously we don't have a program right now with North Korea that's sports diplomacy. So it's not obviously something we're actively supporting. No, I, no, I understand that. Mm-hmm. But, it, I mean, the, the question is, do you think that a private effort like this is worthwhile at all, or does it just complicate not only the situation with Mr. Bay, but your efforts to get the North back to the negotiating table on on the nuclear issue? Uh, Well, there are steps that, as we all know, and we talk about quite a bit in here, the North North Koreans can take if they want to uh, return back to the negotiating table. I'm not going to do analysis of what his visit means for that or doesn't mean for that. They could take steps if they wanted to take those steps, as we've talked about, the ball is in their court. Right, well, I just don't have any more analysis okay. well, of, of his visit if and you, impact. If you did believe it was the time for sports diplomacy, would you have some kind of program in place, do I you think? I think that's a probably yes. a safe assumption, right. Matt. So you do not believe it is the time. You agree with the NBA, with Commissioner Stern. I, I don't want to uh, endorse or have any commentary on his comments. I'll, I'll leave their statement as it is. Sorry to belabor it, but do you think... I'm sorry, but do you, do you think this should be should not be interpreted as a ping pong diplomacy? Let's say of decades past. Oh, we're trying. introducing a new sport in here, ping pong. Uh, okay, I understand. I mean, that should not be related in any way to what happened in China some many decades ago. Uh, what, tell me what you mean by doing sports well, diplomacy was, there, there in a country. There were teams and players going playing ping pong and all this thing. It was it was a prelude for uh, the opening to China. No one. No one, no one should lose uh, sight of what our focus is with North Korea, which is obviously we're focused on a denuclearized peninsula, uh, North Korea to take steps, uh, including abiding by the 2005 joint statement, uh, abiding by their international obligations. Uh, they could, our focus right now should be on uh, what the North Korean people are going through, the plight of the North Korean people, their lack of access to, uh, of humanitarian access of, to, 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 the, to the resources they need. Uh, so that's what we're going to direct our focus on. Well, to put it on the flip side, given that Rodman says that he's doing whatever he's doing as a private citizen, and given that even though the U.S. government tells American citizens we don't have relations with this country, we discourage you from going there, but there is no penalty for his going, does the U.S. government simply have to just abide by the fact that people such as Rodman are going to go off and freelance, well, even if there is a complicating factor, which is the well-being of a citizen who has been in North Korean custody for however long he's been in there now, and we don't really know how he's doing. Is this just part of the cost of doing business? Well, I think there were a couple of things that you mentioned in there that I would refute. I mean, one, uh, we don't vet private citizens' travel, as you know, to North Korea or anywhere else. Uh, we don't track it. Um, we, we don't, I'm talking about North Korea, we don't, um, uh, we don't, we have not been contacted by Mr. Rodman about his trip to North Korea or about any other trip uh, that he's taken. Uh, our focus is certainly on securing Kenneth Bay's release. Um, we've, we're prepared to send uh, Ambassador King to North Korea if North, Korea, if North Korea reinstates the invitation, which they, as you know, withdrew last uh, August. Uh, and that's, we're working through our own channels uh, to pursue that, um, and that's where our focus will remain. So that, uh, just on that line about the invitation mm-hmm. to Ambassador mm-hmm. King, uh, do you regard that this trip by Mr. Rodman as hurting the chances to get a real diplomat instead of what you might call a basketball court jester into North Korea to actually do something about Mr. Bay and the other human rights concerns that you have. Well, and, and create the impression that because there is no restriction on any U.S. citizen's ability to get on a plane and turn up in Pyongyang, that there's not any retribution 
from the U.S. government for doing so. And so if there is no retribution, it could be perceived as tacit approval of his going. Does that complicate this building's efforts to get Kenneth Bays released? We're pursuing our own efforts. I'm not going to do an analysis of what his visit means or doesn't mean. Uh, I, I don't know how I would be in a position to do that at this point, uh, even if we wanted to. Uh, he is not representing the United States government. Uh, obviously, it's up to uh, North Korea to reinstate the invitation. Uh, it would be impossible for me to analyze uh, whether or not or predict whether or not they will do that. But to put it simply, it's not helpful. To I don't have any more, here. I think, on know, this topic. Do you Go know ahead. if um, you are still trying to arrange, actively trying to arrange a visit by Ambassador <laughs> King? Uh, well, we have, if, if they were to reinstate uh, their invitation, we'd certainly be open to sending him, yes. Right, right. but I mean, are there, any, are there any efforts that you're aware of that are underway right now to kind of, I don't know, uh, arrange for the North Koreans to reinstate the invitation? Uh, I don't have any them uh, specifics on that, Matt. I'm happy yeah. to check if right. there's anything uh, we could speak to on that. Catherine? Uh, Jen, you <clears> said <throat> that uh, Mr. Rodman hasn't reached out to the State Department mm -hmm. regarding his trip. Have you all thought about reaching out to him? Maybe not, as you've said, he's not going on behalf of the U.S. government, but to explain how his comments may be complicating the situation for Mr. Bay? Not that I'm aware of. Mr. Any more North Korea? Again, <coughs> okay, um, isn't he a special envoy for the United States, Mr. Lodeman? Uh No, he, he does not have any official role in the United States government. Why not? Nicholas? Can we move to uh, South Sudan? Absolutely. Um, do, do you have a readout of the conversation uh, Secretary Kerry had uh, yesterday with uh, President Kiir? And are you optimistic about the outcome of the talks uh, uh, which have uh, started in, in Ethiopia because the, the fighting uh, seems mm -hmm. to, to continue on the ground? Uh, well, let me do the readout of the call uh, first. Uh, Secretary Kerry spoke yesterday with South Sudanese President Kiir to discuss ways to advance the talks taking place in Ethiopia between the parties uh, to the conflict in South Sudan. He also, Secretary Kerry also reiterated his support for the democratically elected government of South Sudan. He urged President Kiir to use the talks to find a peaceful democratic way forward and reiterated the need for senior SPLM members currently detained by the government of Sudan to be <coughs> present for political discussions to be meaning meaningful and productive. He asked President Kiir to make good on his commitment to release all political detainees immediately. The two also discussed the urgent need for both sides to immediately halt fighting on the ground and protect civilians even as talk con talks continue. Uh, the Secretary reiterated that the United States will deny support or, and work to apply international pressure uh, to any elements that use force to seize power from the government of South Sudan. Uh, as you know, um, a special <clears throat> uh, envoy, the President's special envoy, Booth is in Ethiopia, has been for the last couple of days in support of the talks between the parties, uh, which are ongoing. He's pressing them to reach a ceasefire and ensure humanitarian access. Uh, we still believe, of course, and continue to reiterate the fact that we believe these negotiations need to be serious, and both sides need to listen to the regime, region and the international community. Uh, they're ongoing, so Nicholas, it's hard for me to give a, an analysis of, of how things are going day to day. Uh, we can talk to our team and see if there's more we can provide to you either later today or, or tomorrow when we meet again on, on how we view uh, the talks and how they're going. Given how much energy both the Bush and the Obama administrations have put into the creation of this new country, how did the world get to this point where they are on the verge of civil war and the leader of this new country is looking to someone who was up until, I guess, three days ago, considered a mortal enemy, President Bashir of Sudan, as someone to help him maintain political power. This is not what people were anticipating when there was the ceremony uh, for independence three years ago now. Uh, well, uh, you touched on the fact that it was three years ago now, and as we know, there can be uh, challenges and ups and downs in any transition. Uh, obviously, the Secretary, as part of his conversation, uh, reiterated his support uh, for the democratically elected government of South Sudan. Uh, he is urging dialogue. That's where our focus is now. Uh, and that is what we feel is in the best interest of the, the people of, of South Sudan. Uh, we don't also don't have any indication uh, that Sudan is playing a negative role in the current political crisis in South Sudan. Uh, I understand there have been reports that uh, President Bashir is on the ground. I don't have more details on that, but uh, 
from our reports from the ground, we don't have an indication they're playing a negative uh, role as, as they work toward peace talks. But, you know, two weeks ago, he was uh, supporting the other guy. I mean, he was supporting Kia. Uh, so is he playing uh, maybe a, a double role here? Is he sort of playing both sides of the fight? I, I think I said we don't have any indication that he's playing a negative role in resolving uh, these the, difficult... Uh, is his role, be, I mean, do you approve his role? Do I approve? Do we do approve, approve of his, of his role? role? I think we've, we've spoken out when we've had concerns about a variety of things he's done, right. uh, and I'm not going to go into all of those. But in terms of this specific uh, case, uh, we don't believe we have no indication that uh, Sudan is playing a negative role in the current, current political crisis. Can you Sudan. say whether you think that he could play a positive role? I I, I don't have any more details on what specifically okay. because, he's doing, Matt. Well, so. all right. Well, I think the reason that there are a lot of the, these questions are being asked mm -hmm. is the U.S. has taken a dim view when uh, when other independent sovereign countries have allowed President Bashir, who is under indictment by the mm -hmm. ICC for war crimes, to visit. Now, if you're saying that you think that it's possible he could play a positive role in helping to avert a civil war in South Sudan and that his visit there could possibly be productive, it would seem that you're taking a slightly... I don't, you're, well, you're, I don't believe that's what I said. I no, think the I know, question but, that's why I, I, but I'm at, you're, you're saying your answer is we don't think that, he, that Sudan proper is playing a negative role. Mm -hmm. The question is whether you think <laughs> President Bashir can play a positive role in helping to resolve the, the situation in South Sudan. And if you do think that, are you no longer concerned about a sovereign country welcoming in an indictee of the ICC? Well, I, I don't have any details on exactly what he was doing there or is still doing there, so let me talk to our team and see if there's more to say about what role he is or isn't playing there. Well, it's also about what role you would like him to play. Sure, sure. Well, especially, too, because there's still unresolved boundary issues. There's still unresolved questions about the status of Abia. They still haven't uh, made any progress on the sharing of uh, I, I, under, I understand all of revenues. that. I think the original yeah. question was about whether he was playing an unhelpful role by being there. So that was the question I was answering. And I will right. check with our uh, Africa team and see if there's more we can convey or, or report from our end about uh, what role he is or isn't playing. I'm not even sure if there is a role that he's playing. But On the issue of his conflict? indictment, could this be a path for redemption for Mr. Bashir to get rid of that indictment? I, I'm not going to do any more analysis until I have more details on, on what he is or isn't doing there. Jim, Go ahead, do you Nadia. see this conflict as a tribal conflict between um, the Dinka and Nuer, or more than a power struggle between two men? And if this is the case, does it worry you more? Because it is, you know, it's it's open for an open conflict, actually, not just uh, settling political scores between um, Riyad Mashar and uh, President Kiir. Uh, you know, obviously the talks are ongoing on the ground. As you know, there are a number of countries that are engaged in this and who want to see regional stability. I don't want to do too much more analysis from here on the causes and, and the reasons uh, to, to, to jeopardize anything that's happening on the ground. Go ahead, Scott. The would-be members of the Machar delegation mm -hmm. who are detained in Juba. Yep. Are detained, as you know, uh, under suspicion of plotting a coup against mm -hmm. the Kir government. In calling for those people to be released, mm -hmm. are you asserting then that it is not your belief that they were involved in an effort to overthrow the Kir government? Uh, let me talk to our, our team about that. I just, uh, I'm still catching up here, I have to admit, on, on this particular issue. I mean, we also said that uh, we would deny support and work to apply international pressure to any elements that use force to seize power from the government of South Sudan. So we are watching and concerned about those reports at the same time. But let me talk to our team and see if we can uh, spell that out a little more clearly. Uh, we only, I have to go up to the bilat in a moment. So, okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, yesterday the vice president, or last night, the vice president uh, spoke with mm -hmm. Maliki and Najafi and so on and reassured both of them, uh, you know, that of uh, U.S. support and so on. But also Iran said that it is willing to send in, you know, help and support to sort of, uh, you know, to bolster Maliki's government mm -hmm. and the fight against theirs. Do you support such a thing? Would you look, you know, sort of uh, negatively at, at Iran inter intervening against the terrorists? Well, l let me be very clear here. We are not working with, we are not coordinating, co coordinating with Iran uh, on any of these efforts. Obviously, we've seen their comments. Uh, we have long rejected uh, violent extremism and advocated a stable security environment, an inclusive political process, and a determined focus on economic development for Iraq to achieve its full potential. Our goals uh, have not changed. I, I don't think uh, we view them as the same goals 
that Iran may have. So we're focused on our own efforts, uh, which, as you mentioned, let me just give you a little more uh, on the call you mentioned. Uh, Vice President Biden spoke with uh, both uh, Prime Minister Maliki and Speaker Nujafi yesterday. Uh, he pressed for a unified effort in combating the ISIL threat in Anbar. We have made clear and we believe Iraq's leaders agree the only way to fight ISIL is through strong coordination with local officials and tribes against our common enemy. Uh, that was uh, a conversation that he had and we're continuing uh, to press on our end. Could you the uh, political uh, mm -hmm. posturing over on the Hill about whether the U.S. should be sending in any troops in addition to the missiles and drones that have already been promised. Has there been any indication from Baghdad that any such personnel assistance would be warranted or desired? Well, uh, I'd be surprised or interested if you have a particular member of Congress who said that, because I haven't uh, seen that. I don't think uh, anyone is arguing for more troops uh, and going back to put more troops uh, in Iraq at this point. But, I mean, one thing that um, I think the Iraqis have asked for that um, Congress has held up mm -hmm. were the Apache mm -hmm. um, helicopters and the F-16s. Mm -hmm. And that's something that the administration wanted to provide, mm -hmm. but that Congress has held up. It looks like Congress, at least Senator Menendez, has said that he might be willing to um, lift his objection because mm -hmm. of the increased need. Is that something that th that you would be now would be willing to um, revisit? Because it did look as if you wanted to do it when the when uh, prime minister sure came. That, that that at the time uh, let me talk to our team and see where we are with that obviously i know marie uh, outlined a number of resources that we were uh, expediting and putting forward with fms uh, funds and obviously that's underway I, I don't have any update on the apaches but i'll check on that for you well, sorry jen but you, you know mm -hmm. you're giving 95 hellfire missiles uh, these are uh, air to surface missiles but the the i'm sorry the iraqis have no need to deliver those missiles how will they be delivered? They don't have the combat aircraft. They don't have the, the combat helicopters to, to fire those missiles. I don't have any more details on it on okay. it for you. I would I would have you suggest you talk to DOD about that. Uh, sure, go ahead. I feel confidence in the Iraqi army because um, we're basically saying that uh, Prime Minister Maliki's uh, forces is unable to tackle the situation in both Ramadi and in Fallujah. Well, the Americans tried before in 2004 mm -hmm. and they couldn't even succeed or succeed with that with a very high price. So how do you expect uh, uh, Prime, Minister Ma uh, Prime Minister Maliki's government to deal with the insurgency, especially with the uh, existence of ISIL on the border? Well, there has been uh, an effort, as you know, because we've, uh, we've talked about it in this briefing room, or my colleague talked about it, underway uh, to work with the uh, local tribes on the ground to, to, fight, uh, to fight and confront ISIL fighters. We've seen some success uh, with that in Ramadi. Uh, Fallujah is, as you, as you know, more challenging, but uh, it, it would be accurate to, uh, to assume that that effort has been underway by the central government for some time. It's not something that comes up uh, overnight or they've just been working on overnight. Um, so our efforts is to, our, our focus is on continuing to work with uh, them on that. Uh, we know the challenges on the ground. We've seen some success. We mentioned uh, some efforts uh, we're undertaking to provide more resources. I don't have anything new on that right now, but, uh, you know, we're taking this day by day. But would you consider arming the, uh, the tribal leaders in, uh, in Anbar like they did before? I don't have any prediction of that. Uh, I don't have anything new beyond what, what, what we announced yesterday. Or paying them. I'm sorry? Yeah. Or paying them which okay. is what happened in the Iraq. Anyway, right. can I move to Israel for a second? Sure. Um, just very quickly, have you guys decided yet whether or not you agree or disagree with Prime Minister Netanyahu and other Israeli officials about the issue of what they call, uh, what they say is Palestinian incitement? Uh, I, I don't know that we have, uh, we've spoken about our concerns about incitement uh, consistently over the course of years, Matt, so I don't know that we have anything new to report or any analysis on the recent comments over the last couple of well, days. Well, do, do you believe that the incitement that Israel is talking about or that Israel claims is in fact increasing, as it says? Uh, I know that that's what they said. I don't have any particular analysis of that. Obviously, our focus is on reducing incitement, calling for an end to incitement. Uh, we think it's un unproductive and unhelpful to the process, uh, as you know. Okay. Well, the, okay. So incitement is bad. I think yes. that's fair to say. Yes. All right. So can you say, so um, when the chief Palestinian negotiator comes out in an interview and says that Israel killed Yasser Arafat, poisoned him, do you regard that as inc incitement? Uh, well, uh, 
we have seen his comments, as you know. Uh, there's decades of mistrust at play here. We're not going to analyze every comment and what it means. Uh, but uh, I would say our focus, uh, as, as Marie said yesterday, remains on both parties and having them at the table and moving the talks forward. You were in the room in Jerusalem last week when mm -hmm. Prime Minister Netanyahu made these comments about Pre President Abbas, mm -hmm. very critical about President Abbas, complaining that uh, or saying that it was incitement when the, the Palestinians welcomed these released prisoners home uh, as heroes. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you believe that a welcoming them, in, uh, welcoming these people, these de <coughs> released detainees as heroes, is incitement? I'm not going to give an analysis of every action and what is incitement and what is not incitement. That's not helpful from here or help from from the United States government or from the podium. Well, well, what I, I will say is that we know this is a tough time. Uh, we're working through the process uh, on the ground. Uh, we know that uh, there are political pressures from all sides, and we're seeing that manifest itself. In many ways, the leaders remain engaged and committed, and that's what our focus is right. on. Right. Well, wouldn't you – what – I don't understand this argument that it's not it, – it wouldn't be helpful, so you're not just going to do it uh, – so you won't – so you won't take a stand uh, and, and on what you say you believe that incitement is bad, and then when a specific example comes up, you – you think it's unhelpful, it's not helpful to, to say it? I'm not going to get into a Wouldn't scenario of labeling every instance that happens. Well, is it possible to say that the Israelis killed the Palestinian former leader by one of the negotiators? We think there are a range of comments that have been made that are unhelpful. I'm not going to do an, an I'm not going to do an All analysis. Right. Well, can of you it. say has, has have you expressed the, the, the have you expressed your unhappiness or your anger or whatever your feelings your <laughs> not feelings, your <laughs> position to uh, the to uh, to either side when they when they make these comments? Of course. It's fair to say that right. a great deal of our diplomacy here happens privately. Uh, right. That's in the best interest of the process. And do you believe that it is helpful right. to the publics on both sides for you not to take a public position when, some, when someone uh, from either side comes out and says something that you believe is just factually and historically incorrect and false? Well, Matt, what we feel would be helpful to the public would be an agreement on final status negotiations that would bring peace to the region. So the we're is, not going to take wait, steps that would hurt that process. Okay, okay. But Prime Minister Netanyahu argues that the Palestinians, by calling these released prisoners heroes, by accusing the Israel, by accusing Israel of killing uh, Arafat, it, they that they are not preparing the Palestinian people for a potential uh, peace agreement with Israel. Do you agree or disagree with that? And do you find that do you, do you do you I'll leave it at that? Do you agree or disagree with Prime Minister Netanyahu's criticisms and complaints? That can you say it one more time? That the Palestinians, the leadership, including the, their president, President Abbas, and their chief negotiator, are not helping to prepare the Palestinian people for a possible eventual peace agreement. Matt, we're not going to get into, I'm not going to speak to that. You know, we, the Secretary feels that both sides are negotiating good faith. We know that there are comments that are made from both sides that are received poorly or negatively from the other side. That's a part of the process that we anticipated. Uh, we're there as a, uh, as a, as a, as a, an arbiter between them, okay. uh, but we're not going to speak to or analyze or give commentary on every comment. But made. if you're an arbiter, doesn't it isn't it your responsibility to call people out when they do these things? No, an arbiter is working to bring both sides closer together to come to an agreement can on I, a final can status I get one negotiation. In? Can I get one in? <coughs> sure. Um, for Minister Lieberman, there mm -hmm. have been reports that he's engaged in a kind of parallel discussions with the Palestinians, and I'm wondering if he discussed this with Secretary Kerry in their meeting, and whether you think that this type of um, kind of side negotiations or side discussions are helpful to the process that you have going? I'm not aware of that, or I'm not even sure if that's an accurate uh, report. Um, but the Secretary did meet with uh, <coughs> Foreign Minister uh, Lieberman, as you mentioned. Uh, he's put a range of ideas and proposals out there. Our focus is on uh, working through the negotiating team with both sides. Have you tried to clarify the, these reports? Uh, I, I'm not. I wasn't even aware of them until uh, this are point. So I'm sorry. I have to go up to the bilateral meeting. Like, I'm sorry, like Saeed. I'm sorry. A meeting <laughs> between Netanyahu and Abbas. Mm -hmm. Would you like to see a meeting in time soon uh, between Netanyahu and Abbas? Our position hasn't changed. At some point, if that's useful, we'll work toward that. Well, at some point, it might be useful if you want a peace deal. All right. I gotta go.